All right, everyone. So welcome to another episode of the Living Better podcast. This is an amazing interview that I've been looking forward to. Today we are with Dr. Andrian Ledoux, and we're going to be talking about kids and concussion and exactly the power of optimizing activity to maximize concussion treatment. And this is research, new breakthrough research that Dr. Anagan Ledoux has been taking part of. So she's going to be able to share that with us today. So thanks for being on the show. How are you doing today? Well, thank you for having me on the show. I'm doing great. Thank you. Great. So why don't we start about talking a bit about your credential? What led you to uh, become a doctor and actually wanted to work with children and kids and do some research in that area? So I guess to make a long story short, um, I am a, a PhD. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I did my, my uh, doctorate, so my, my PhD in neuropsychiatry, so more specifically in schizophrenia, where um, I, I was looking at how the memory of uh, individuals that have schizophrenia, how it works. And we had, um, I was doing a lot of neuroimaging with virtual reality with them to really try to understand um, a small component in the brain that's called the, the hippocampus and just see how mm -hmm. it's functioning. And um, life kind of just happened. I had, during my PhD, I had uh, one child and straight after my PhD, I had twins. And so that kind of just stalls your career right there, having three <laughs> kids, especially for, for a woman in science. And so for me, it was kind of out of the question to go outside of my region or go, you know, to another province or to, to the United States to, to do research in, in neuropsychiatry. And there was this really awesome opportunity here um, in Ottawa um, at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario and uh, on concussion, pediatric concussion. I had, you know, touched a bit uh, on it during my PhD as well. And I thought that would be, you know, uh, an awesome jump and something new to learn. So I did my postdoc um, at CHEO. Okay. In, um, and uh, where I looked at kind of the natural progression of recovery in, in kids uh, that have a concussion. And that's kind of where everything started. So that, that's been my background. Um, so I, if you want to know my credentials, I am, um, so my PhD was in experimental psychology okay. and I have a specialization in behavioral neuroscience. So right now I am a professor, assistant professor for um, the cellular molecular uh, medicine department. So the neuroscience department at Ottawa U mm -hmm. and for psychology. And as well, I am an adjunct at Carleton University. All right. So let's talk a little bit about your background. What has led you to this path of becoming interested in the mind and in children even more so? Uh, if you want to talk a bit about your upbringing and yeah, what, what brought you to become a doctor and study this field, this very interesting field of neuroscience. So um, since I've been a, a child, I have always been very interested in science, uh, very interested as well in evolution and how we got from being, you know, walking on, on our hands and feet to, to being biped, walking on two feet and what happened and really what happened is, is our brain evolved a lot, uh, making us able to, to start standing and walking. And so this evolution uh, of the brain has always uh, fascinated me and so this is kind of why i went into psychology understanding mm -hmm. mind understanding how how the brain works and, and more so into behavioral um, um psychology and behavioral neuroscience so understanding um the brain and how it creates our behavior um i have been always interested in that and uh, one um one course in particular is when I was uh, in high school, a physics class, where we were talking a lot about uh, uh, the brain and the electricity. And I had made a presentation about the electricity in the brain, which, uh, of course, is kind of how the neurons are, are communicating with one another. And it just fascinated me. And, and since then, I've been hooked on um, psychology and, um, and the brain, yes, and the mind. And, and um, was there any scientist or any people in your family that, that, that you were relating to? Or this is just something that from being a little girl, you build on onto? No, uh, no scientist. I, I no? think my dad was quite um, uh, helpful in, in the way that, you know, he really believed in evolution. He was always there uh, showing me evidence-based, you know, science yeah. and, and 
and being quite, uh, you know, showing me how to be really uh, critical um, about uh, or septic about what I see and, and okay. to try to, to think in a, in a critical way. So I think that's, that's, but I, we don't have any scientists not in the family. <laughs> no. So, so you're uh, the, you're the only yeah. one. So they must be yeah. asking you tons of questions. Yeah. <laughs> mm. Sometimes they ask Sometimes. more about gardening, <laughs> gardening than anything else. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So you have a new interesting research when it comes to children in regards to concussions. Yeah. So first of all, before we dive into that, let's try to explain to the audience what is a concussion and what happens when somebody has a concussion within their, their mind, their brain, and body. And that is a fantastic question, uh, a question that many people actually don't um, don't truly understand. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, just before I dive into this, if we just look a bit at, at statistics in, in Canada, um, about one in two Canadians actually have no knowledge about uh, no knowledge at all about concussions. So just yeah. under Understanding what it is is so important to try to recognize it as well afterwards, especially in, in the field of pediatrics. So what is a concussion? So a concussion is a brain injury. So it's a mild traumatic brain injury. And so how this happens is the injury usually will be induced by a direct or indirect blow to the head, to the face, to the neck, or anywhere else on the body. And so you don't need to directly get hit on the head. Oh, wow concussion right so if you're on the field you're a football player and you get um you're, you're running really really fast the other person is really running fast and body checks you on uh you know on the shoulder or on the chest the power the force can be strong enough to give you a concussion and so what actually happens in the brain when you get hit really really fast is that your brain will shift from one side to another and so okay. there will be acceleration deceleration of the brain there will be as well rotational force applied to the brain so if we kind of want to look at it in a different way if you take kind of a bowl of jello think about you know those upside cakes that we used to have in like in the 1980s where, where it was jello <laughs> put it down and it jiggles <laughs> and it jiggles think about that and think about like kind of hitting it or just you know t tapping it and you know how the jello will do waves in it yeah. Our, our brain is actually not stiff, right? Our brain is actually a structure that if I would pull out my brain and put it on the table, well, it would kind of collapse on the table. So it's a okay. really stiff structure. And so you can imagine that if you apply really fast force, like forces to it, it will jiggle and there will be wave forms that are gonna be transmitted to the brain. And so these waves forms, what happened is the, the brain is, you know, it's, uh, it's, um, uh, the, the, it's a bunch of cells that are kind of folded one all folded together right and so these waves form are going to stretch out parts of the brain and they're going to stretch out our nerves in the brain in the brain and it's going to affect as well um, the cells and in the end it will affect as well the the normal functioning of the brain so that's in just that's kind of what a concussion is and I think it's very interesting that you're saying it because most people, they think it's just a hard hit to the head, right? They don't understand what's happening. It's okay, well, if you get a hard hit to the head, you get a concussion. But it's interesting enough that just the force being applied to your body uh, without a direct blow to the head can create a concussion. And that's something that a lot of people were not aware of, I believe. Yes, yes, definitely. And and what happens actually is that, you know, in some, it might not create a concussion, but in others that don't have as stronger necks, for instance, kids, their mm -hmm. necks are not as strong as yourself, for instance, or as yeah. an adult. Well, it's harder. The muscles can't absorb the shock. And so it can go directly to, to the brain. So the force can uh, travel directly to the brain and make the brain accelerate, decelerate um, in the skull. So just to reinforce that point is is this why like boxers or mma fighters they train their neck so they're doing a lot of neck exercise to strengthen the neck would that prevent them from getting concussion when they get hit in the head because their neck is strong um, i don't know if we could say would prevent because they're still getting hit in, <laughs> in the yeah. head getting yeah. hit in the head i think is, is uh with, with uh, you know a lot of force would uh, create a concussion but uh, but for sure the neck force can absorb part of the shock of um okay shock. yeah and is a concussion a defensive mechanism of your body or it's just a result of the trauma that happens 
uh, it's a result of the trauma that happens. Okay, so it's not a defensive mechanism. All right. Well, I mean, you, you might have mechanisms afterwards that are going to happen. So, you know, the, the first thing that occurs, so the first event is getting hit. And then, you know, the, the second event is you'll have a, a you know, biological cascade or a mm -hmm. biological cascade of, um, of mechanisms that, that are going to occur. And these are there to try to protect the brain as well. So these are partly damaged, but these are as well. Uh, you know, uh, I'm trying uh, inflammatory mechanisms that are going to be set in to try to help the, the, the brain out as well, right? So yes. you could say it's a, a bit of both, but really the concussion is a result of getting hit. It's not a defensive mechanism. Okay. And in terms of your research, this is where you stepped in to research the recovery process post-concussion. What's the best way to recover from a concussion, especially more so in children, right? Which is what you've been doing. Exactly. Uh, that, that has what I have been doing. But I think, you know, before we go um, that far ahead, I think it's important to understand that uh, why we want to treat concussion and, and why it's so important to, to wanting to, to treat concussion as fast as, as we can or as soon as possible. Um, so after a concussion, you actually have many symptoms and many, many of these symptoms are not really sp spoken about, but for instance, you can have emotional and behavioral symptoms. So the child or even the adult, you know, might be more anxious, might be, um, uh, uh, might, uh, be more depressed. Um, you have as well the physical signs, so nausea, headache. And, um, and you also have the mental signs that uh, examples are difficulty thinking, you know, being in the fog, um, sleeping issues, sleeping too much, sleeping not enough. And all of these symptoms, what happens is you'll have these symptoms right after having your concussion. But, you know, in some kids, these symptoms are actually going to last for, for a long time. And some of these kids, about, I think, three out of 10 um, kids, so 30% of the pediatric population will actually have um, these symptoms that are going to last more than four weeks and can last for years after having their concussion. And so this is kind of why it's important for us to start thinking of prevention, prevention of prolonged symptoms. So prolonged symptoms here, in this case, we call it after four weeks, we call it persistent post-concussive symptom. But how can we prevent or, or reduce the risk of having persistent post-concussive symptom is is the big question, and that's um, and that is a big question that I have in my lab of finding different interventions that can help us really um, figure out ways of ameliorating our management um, of uh, of concussion. Okay, and how did you get interested into this type of research? Were there like your own children got a concussion, somebody in your family, or just kind of something that was out there? People were talking about it in your practice, and you're like, "Yeah, I want to be part of this." Yeah, well, it's it's pretty much a, a, the latter one. So in, in yeah. the lab, I I was um, working for um, Roger Zemek, who is a renowned uh, pediatrician, so an emergency. Okay. Position. Um, so he has the chair in pediatric concussion at Ottawa U. And uh, this is, was one of his projects that he had started. And I kind of uh, helped a lot with the project, but was really to try to, to investigate ways of, of reducing symptoms or of preventing persistent post-concussive symptoms at four weeks. And, and the first project um, that uh, we had received funding for was the PCARE study. So, uh, and the, the PCARE study is a pediatric concussion assessment of rest and exertion. And it's there to, um, to assess uh, whether physical activity is good after having a, con a concussion and whether it, um, it will reduce symptoms at two weeks and at four weeks. Wow. Okay. So let's talk about what your research uh, has brought in terms of new knowledge. So first, let's dive into the old protocol. So the, from my belief and my understanding, it was that when people had a concussion, they have to rest, minimize physical activity to prevent them from either hitting their head a little bit because the brain's swollen. And that would be kind of like the protocol, just a lot of rest, limit activities and allow the symptoms to diminished. So what's the new research? Okay, well, uh, let's go back with, with the old protocol, because I yeah. think it's 
important to to highlight um, sure. with the old protocol to understand the new one. Um, yeah. So you're right. The old protocol was um, to rest um, until you had no more symptoms, and then afterwards you could start resuming physical activity. And yeah. um, but here, you know, a lot of physicians kind of took that really literally, and so patients, you know, adults as well. And this is not just for kids. This was for adults and kids. <laughs> Um, well, they would be prescribed after the confession, you would get told, okay, well, it's time for you to go home and you can't do anything. You can't do your normal activities. Obviously you can't do sports. Um, you can't go to school. You can't go to work. Um, if light is really, um, you're really sensitive to light, put yourself in a dark room and, and that's it. Mm -hmm. and surprisingly today as well, many physicians are still recommending these old guidelines, but the guidelines have actually changed since. Okay. Um, and so the new guidelines, which uh, our, our research has actually contributing to, contributed to modify these guidelines, but the, the newer guidelines, what they state is that um, after a concussion, you need to rest for one to two days. Mm -hmm. And after that one to two days, you can start doing physical activity or you can start returning to your um, to your routine, your daily routine, as long as you can tolerate the symptoms. Okay. And um, if symptoms are intolerable, you shouldn't be doing that much activity. You should, you know, stop, rest, and um, and then continue on the, the next day to try again. So those are the new uh, the new guidelines. Now, what we did in terms of research uh, is the first research that we did was uh, published in JAMA, and um, and this was out of uh, Roger Zemek's uh, lab. And what we figured out is that we we had this large sample population of over three thousand children, and we we assessed whether returning to physical activity within seven days could reduce the risk of having persistent post-concussive symptoms, so prolonged symptoms at four weeks. And we figured out that those that actually started physical activity within seven days, well, their risk of having persistent post-concussive symptoms was significantly lower than those that started physical activity after seven days. Okay. And to give you uh, numbers, um, those that uh, I have them right here, actually. So those that did resume physical activity within seven days were, they had a risk of 24.6% of developing prolonged symptoms at four weeks compared to those that return after seven days, their risk was doubled. It was 43%. Wow. So that's the significant which, drop. Which is exactly. So if you exactly. So if you start, you go back to your activities, then it, it promotes, you know, it, it promotes, um, uh, it recovery, but it helps you as well recover because you're going back to your daily routine. You're going back to seeing your friends, for instance, in, in the pediatric world. Um, just in terms of just physical activity, physical activity actually has tons of uh, benefit for your mm -hmm. brain. But just returning to life as well has tons of benefit for your brain. Just imagine yourself being prevented from doing your daily routines, mm -hmm. right? And so just physical activity in itself, it improves your mood, it improves your sleep, it improves yep. your thinking, right? Your cognition. It in kids, it will improve them. Those that, that do physical activity without having a concussion, they will have better scores at school, right? It improves oh. their academic performance. Uh, same for adults, it will improve their, their work performance. Um, and if we just look at the brain and what happens to the brain, it actually increases, it helps blood flow in your brain increases blood flow in your brain and it helps repair your brain as well physical activity and if you have a concussion well you kind of need to repair your brain you have damage to your brain so why not use physical activity as a treatment after having a concussion right wow and so that that was the the first study but the issue with this study was it was associative it was a okay. correlation and because it was a correlation, we can't say specifically that yes, physical activity is what um, is the magic ingredient in order for you not to have persistent post-concussive symptoms at four weeks, mm -hmm. right? 
if you yeah. just think of uh, of uh, today's um, uh, where we're at in the pandemic right now, well, we're doing a lot of research in vaccines, right? And they're all clinical trials, and mm -hmm. clinical trials are actually very. It's uh, probably the the ma magic research design that is needed to prove that the vaccine is working. You're always comparing it to, let's say, a placebo. So. If we return to, to my research, this is what was needed. What was needed was a clinical trial to see if the kids that are assigned by chance to physical activity, well, is it really physical activity that is um, reducing their symptoms at four weeks, right? And yeah. that's, that, that is um, where we're at right now. And so this is the study I was uh, talking to earlier, P-CARE, which mm -hmm. is, um, uh, which is a study that's there to figure out, well, when is it better to return to physical activity? At what time? And mm -hmm. is it safe to return to physical activity? And why do I say safe here? It's just many physicians are still prescribing rest because they don't think that it is safe to return to physical activity. There's not mm -hmm. a lot of objective evidence out there to say that it is safe to return to physical activity. You're not going to damage your brain. Mm -hmm. Okay. And just to touch on that, in terms of you working at CHEO and the benefits of physical activity um, with the ongoing pandemic, I, you know, a lot of things have been shut down and a lot of activities, especially for kids, have been shut down. Um, have you seen an increase of kids showing up or parents showing up with their kids where the kids are having either depression or experiencing some sort of uh, issues in regards to that lowered level of physical activity? Uh, it, well, uh, so uh, I'm not a physician, so I don't work in the emergency department, but I, I do work for it. Yeah. Uh, but we did note, so um, we do note an increase in mental health. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a flow of patients, a high flow of patients that are coming in to the emergency department, but as well into adult uh, general hospitals. These are young, young folks that come, up, come to the emergency department with mental health issues with uh, suicidal thoughts, uh, suicidal ideation, um, a lot of as well, um, substance abuse. Mm -hmm. uh, so is that because of a lack of physical activity? I think it's, yeah, I, I think it's because of multiple reasons. It's not just physical activity. However, we did note just, just as a mother myself, and this, I guess, is not uh, uh, scientific, but, but just learning at, at home, reduces the level of physical activity that, that a kid will do, right? It's, you yeah. know, they're sitting in front of a computer. Um, it, it's boring. It's boring for them, right? They do need to see their friends, but they do need to do this this level of physical activity to, to maintain health. So is there a direct association with the increased amount of mental health um, that we're seeing at CHEO and, and the lack of physical activity? Perhaps, but I think that still needs to be um, researched some more to yeah. define the link. Okay. So what's the next step in terms of your, your research? Like you said, so you've noticed that physical activity kind of accelerates the healing of the brain and it prevents recurrent or post symptoms uh, after a concussion. So now you're trying to really isolate the fact that physical activity is really a, a factor uh, in terms of, so that's the next step in your research. So you discovered some sort of a hidden gem and now you're like digging deeper on it, right? Exactly. So now we're, we're digging deeper on it. Um, just uh, on the side note, um, there is out there new uh, randomized clinical trials that have identified that physical activity within 48 as after 48 hours of having a concussion is, um, is really beneficial. Um, this was an adolescent, but it was done in the lab. So it was not done at home. Um, our research is done um, out at home in the community. And so, um, and what was I gonna say, I can't recall. Uh, <laughs> so in terms of the next step um, oh, yeah. in the, the research to isolate that physical activity is a big factor. Exactly, so to isolate physical activity, to say that yes, physical activity is reducing symptoms and yes, it is safe. That is where we're at right now. So the okay. clinical trial is actually over. We completed it um, in January, 2020. Mm -hmm. um, so we enrolled our last participant, January, 2020. And uh, now what we're doing is we're analyzing the data. And uh, up to now we found that um, 
between the two groups. So our, our first group, I think it's just important. I, I kind of forgot to say what was our two groups, but our, our first group for this trial to try to really um, narrow down to see if it's physical activity. So the, the first group that we, we tested were kids that were assigned to resume physical activity after 72 hours of their concussion. And so they okay. would slowly return to physical activity. And by slowly it means, you know, the first day they could walk for 15 minutes um, outside. Next day, if uh, symptoms were tolerable, they could move on to light jogging. Um, following day, if symptoms were tolerable, they could move on to, um, to jogging more vigorously, so at a, a higher intensity, and, and, and so on. And so that's what we mean by, by resuming physical okay. activity in, uh, in, a, in a stepwise matter. Um, and our other group for, for this study is um, rest until asymptomatic. And so what we mean by that is once we had recruited these patients, they needed to rest until they had no more symptoms before resuming physical activity. Okay. And when they would resume physical activity, it would be in the same stepwise matter. So the same protocol used. And so we've noticed that um, when we look at, at the difference between both groups, um, there's actually no significant difference between both groups okay. um, in terms of symptoms at two weeks. And so, uh, and so here we can say that, hey, those that were septic, that returning to physical activity is, is bad for you. Well, actually, it's, it, it, it doesn't change anything much. It's, you, you end up having the same level of symptoms between, uh, between both groups. And what we figured out, though, when analyzing a bit deeper this data is actually that many don't follow rules. Many don't follow the protocol. They do as they please. And so many that were part of the rest until asymptomatic group actually started to do physical activity <laughs> quite early, even though they were symptomatic. And why we know this is that we followed these kids with an actical. Okay. An actical is an accelerometer that was worn um, uh, at the hip for 24 hours a day for 14 consecutive days. Okay. And, but when we look at this data and we, and we start looking at what they were logging, if they were symptomatic or not, well, we start figuring out like, hey, many actually didn't uh, comply to our protocol. And so when we just look at those that complied to the protocol, well, we see a, a significant difference. And so we see that those that actually were part of the physical activity arm, so those that needed to resume physical activity within mm -hmm. hours, they have an 8% reduction in symptoms at okay. two weeks. At two weeks. And then it becomes significantly higher as the time goes by, right? Uh, I'm not sure. We we haven't uh, tested that yet. So right now we're still uh, at that. We're trying to, to publish that first study first. And okay where we're at well with that same study what's kind of neat is that we decided to collect a bunch of mris okay. so we have a, a sub sample of our participants where we collected um a neuroimaging acquisition at 72 hours mm -hmm. and at four weeks post in, post intervention to see kind of what's happening in the brain to again try to prove that hey it is safe to return to physical activity mm -hmm. we're not destroying the brain but as well, it's, it's giving us an opportunity or a, a window to peek into the brain and see what are the recovery processes of concussion. And I think this is actually very important. You would think that, you know, in concussion, um, that, that that would be the first thing that we would study directly the brain. But, um, but in concussion, what's happening is we use a lot of self-reported measurements to assess whether a kid is... Uh, doing better. And it's never really objective. There's actually not an objective measurement that okay. exists to diagnose a concussion, right? And so, and, and so bringing on this objective measurement of MRI to a clinical trial is very, very novel. And it's, um, and I can't wait to, to see uh, the results that are co gonna come out of, uh, of, of those mm -hmm. subsets. Oh, that's uh, that's amazing. And in terms of uh, picking up your groups, are you just uh, are they part of like just the, the kids that are showing up to the hospital with concussions because you don't purposely create a concussion to study them? So or is it, they show up with the parents or something and you ask them if they want to be part of a research, right? Is that exactly. how it works? So that's how it works. That is an ex yeah. excellent question. Um, yeah. So we I 
I am part of the emergency department at the children uh, at CHEO. And mm -hmm. we, it's an academic hospital, CHEO. And so we do a lot of research um, with our patients. And so when a child comes into the emergency department uh, yeah. with a head injury, with suspected head injury, mm -hmm. uh, then we go ask them if they would like to be part of a study. And before enrolling them, obviously we screen them. We make sure that they truly have a concussion. Yeah. Uh, if they have a concussion, we consent them and we enroll them into the study. That's how it works. Okay. And in terms of controlling the severity of the concussion, because somebody might have a really light concussion from falling on from their bicycle and another child, uh, I don't know, played football and got tackled or something, or, you know, hit by a car or something. So how do you measure that when they don't have the same degree of concussions? Because you can't really say like, this one has a mild one, this one has a heavy concussion. So this one, like when you try to assess how they recover with physical activity, they don't start at the same baseline, right? So yeah, they, they don't really start at, at the same baseline. You know, in an emergency department, another thing is we tend to have um, uh, more um, severe quote unquote concussions, uh, many, children that will have a concussion, you know, playing to the park, often parents are actually not even going to go see a physician, or they might actually just go see their primary care provider, right? And so these concussions are, are missed. Um, so we, the, the way that, that we control for it, uh, we like to use a, um, a 5P score rule. And the, this rule is actually not based on, it's per, partially based on severity upon presentation, but as well on personal factors. Okay. And um, just to see how they will be doing at four weeks. And so this is something that was um, started by Roger Zemeck, um, uh, at CHEO a little while back, and he, he basically created this algorithm to figure out which kid will go on having prolonged symptoms. And so we, we kind of nested those variables within our analysis to try to control for severity. So it's an indirect measurement, if you want, of severity. But I, I think, you know, what, what's important to understand is, um, you know, the, the severity of the concussion will have limited impact on how long you're going to have your symptoms what's hmm. more important is actually pre-injury symptoms and how you are pre-injury um, you know if you do have anxiety or if you do have depression or if you have migraines for instance um, you suffer from adhd um, so we do have a bunch of little factors so mental health a lot of mental health um, are included in there so if you have um, these pre-injury conditions after having your concussion, chances are you'll be doing worse than if you didn't have these predisposed con mm -hmm. uh, condition. And this is what's gonna last for, for a longer period of time. So the, the association or, or what is um, affecting more of these kids is the fact that they had pre-injury conditions, right? Okay, so if you have pre injury conditions those pre-injury conditions will be ac accentuated by the concussion so yeah, somebody who's mildly depressed might be severely depressed after a concussion well, I, I wouldn't go by it by severely depressed but just no. to give you a, a, an example um mm -hmm. that's a bit more anxious um you know gets a concussion after the concussion uh you know they they start spiraling into this oh I'm scared of going to back to sport. I'm scared of going yes. back to school. Um, uh, what what are all others going to think about me? What um, and, and so you have all the these negative questions that that start spiraling, and this negativity is not um, is not good for the body. It's it's not good for the brain either. And um, and so this is why perhaps they're still having symptoms later on. But we do have other predisposed um, variables that are gonna that that might uh, predict if you're gonna have prolonged symptoms. So for instance, age. For instance, sex. So if you're a female, it seems that if you're a female uh, and you're in your adolescent years, you might have longer symptoms compared to a male that is um, that that has the same age. And why is that? Why is that? <laughs> that is the ultimate question that yeah. everybody's 
asking themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there, there is a lot of uh, theories and hypotheses that have been given about this. Uh, one is um, the neck, the neck size. Okay. You know, have, uh, you know, uh, not as strong necks as males. Uh, we also have question, uh, I mean, the, the size of the axons, there's this uh, theory that was postulated that the size of um, the nerves in our brain, the axons are actually mm -hmm. bigger in male adolescents than in female. Oh, yeah. So perhaps that, that might be a reason because a concussion is, you know, the stretching, the stretching of these axons of these nerve yeah. bundles. Um, there's other reasons that are more um, psychosocial. So perhaps a female is um, when she self raises herself on, on symptoms, she might rate herself always higher than a male. So it might be just more perceptual. Okay. Right. right. So, so we, we, uh, this, that is the ultimate question right now in concussion. Are females really more at risk? of having severe symptoms or is it just more psychosocial it's more of a, a gender difference okay and um one question i had for you if somebody like a kid has a concussion or anybody are they more prone to getting more concussions down the road and that's something that people believe or as something i was led to believe so i want to know it directly from the pro um so it, when you look at the statistics, uh, someone that has a concussion will be more likely to get a, a second concussion. So yeah. they're more prone to it. Is it because they, they it stays inflamed or um, even though they make a full recovery or? Oh, well, it's, it's, it's hard to say. It's hard to say what, what's going on in the brain because we, we lack so much, uh, uh, you know, neurological evidence to, to support that. Mm -hmm perhaps of the brain is still inflamed you know we we might have uh you know axons that are still stretched it might take you know a really long time for axons to heal and so within the space of a year you're not healed yet and you get a second concussion um okay. in our in one of our studies that uh that was done I, at chio I, I believe i can't recall the percentage but i think um it was um those that had a concussion for one of our studies, we looked again if they had a second concussion, and within that space of a year, there was something like eight, maybe between eight and thirteen percent of the population had had a second concussion. Okay. Right, well, which, yeah. which is huge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. It, Somehow, yes. Which is huge, and and so so I guess getting the second concussion, if it's because the brain is still inflamed, I think it depends when exactly you get it, get the second or, or third concussion. Okay. Right. But you're more prone, uh, especially within, you know, the, the first uh, few months after having a concussion, because you're still healing. And so your, your um, cognition is not perhaps not fully back to normal, right. You might still have um, issues taking, quick speedy uh decision and this is kind of one of the reasons why we say after you have a concussion you can't go back to sports right away you can't go back on the field right away to play tackle football because cognitively cognitively conceive i don't <laughs> cognitively yeah you're, you're not ready for it your, your body is still in, in this um in this um it is still recovery stage it's in a recovery yeah. stage but yeah. still um uh, in, in this stage where it, it's in an energy crisis and the energy can't be given to the regions of the brains that are, are needed to go and play football and so when you play football you have to think you know you have to 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 look around yourself and uh and and make sure you're not going to get tackled right or or make sure you see the ball and all of these are all co cognitive tasks that that take a lot of energy and um and so you you can get a second concussion quite quite easily okay and uh for parents who will be listening to this is there any way to either enhance their kid's brain or something they can do either to protect it from getting a concussion? Um, do you have any tips or tricks for parents out there? Um, so I, I think it's always good to, to follow the typical rules of, you know, when you go biking, when you go rollerblading or any type of sports that, that you know, that has a vehicle with it. 
uh, with it. Uh, so, you know, those dirt bikes, et cetera, to wear your helmet, to wear uh, the prescribed helmet that, that is required for that sport. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's the, the best prevention measurement yeah. right there. Um, and, uh, and, you know, life happens. So getting concussion can happen even if you, you're trying your best to prevent it. Um, in terms of strategies to help recovery, that's where I think I can be most helpful. Yes. Um, we, we do have um, strategies that, that were developed that, that are part of the, the Ontario guidelines. So if ever uh, parents or, or even adults have a concussion and are listening to your podcast and yep. want to go to see it, we have our living guidelines that are up in a, uh, um, that are up. Um, it's, uh, I believe I would need to find the, the link to tell you right now, but I be, believe it's uh, a living guidelines. Hold on. Let me just type this. No problem. So that would be the current protocol so the that current is protocol. given. Exactly. So the, the uh, website is braininjuryguidelines.org. Okay. And we all, you have the adult guidelines that are there and we have the pediatric concussion guidelines that are there um, that uh, have, there's tons of resources to help you, you know, understand what is a concussion, what you can do to help your child, what can, can you do to help yourself after a concussion. But let, let me just return to, to your question. <laughs> yep. so, um, so strategies to help um, with recovery. Um, so we have several of them. So first of all, the, the best one that I can say is that returning to physical activity is safe. When I say return to physical activity, however, I'm not saying that the day after your concussion, you put your kid into skates and they can go play hockey. Right. It's really I'm saying that returning to physical activity is a slow return to physical activity is safe. And, and that is important. It's important for the body. It's important for, for the psychological health of the child, um, for, for his mood, et cetera. Um, so returning to physical activity within 40 hours, that, that is fine. Um, second strategy is to try to help and, and avoid having, you know, or persistent post-concussive symptoms um, can be um, finding energy conservation techniques, um, can, trying to optimize sleeping. That, that myth that after you have a concussion, you shouldn't be sleeping is false. Sleeping okay. is really important. Your, your brain is trying to heal itself. So it does need sleep. Um, nutrition, obviously eating healthy is important. Your brain is once again, trying to heal. It needs these these important um, nutrients, uh, right? So. Nutrients, exactly, to, to be able to heal. And uh, another technique uh, is uh, learning how to relax, learning to under identify the stressors that your kid might have during his recovery. So for instance, stressors can be well, at school, um, they have, uh, the, the child has um, an exam. So, you know, the six-year-old, uh, now this, this, uh, this, um, 13 or 14 year old has uh, an exam and it's stressing them. Well, they shouldn't be doing, first of all, an exam after having a concussion or within the week that they had their concussion. Okay. So, you know, talking to um, the, the school, trying to integrate techniques to reduce stress in order for them not to have symptoms. Okay. And so just ways that, you know, uh, a kid, so I, the, the first thing that I said was energy conservation, yep. but just ways that uh, a child can, or an adult as well, can try to, to save their, their energy is, we, we call this, um, we, we have this uh, little um, graph that, that we have in the guidelines, and it's really about prioritizing um, what's important, okay. right? So no, uh, identifying in advance, well, you know, today I'm going to do what's important in order to conserve my, my energy, right? I'm not going to do a hundred things. I just had a concussion. I will try to prioritize what's important. Second thing is to try to plan how you're going to get, how you're going to manage what, what's important. So how you're going to um, get that task done. Third is pacing yourself. So, you know, take breaks. Breaks are important. You're trying to heal. So if, you know, the task is giving you sudden headache, well, pace yourself through it. And, um, and, and then finally, it's the position. So position yourself in a place where you'll be able, that's going to be stress-free, where you're 
actually going to be able to do the task, right? So if we're talking that you're working and you had a concussion, well, you shouldn't be working in an environment that has a lot of noise. Maybe that will, you know, trigger some symptoms. So just position yourself in a place that is more relaxing, is less stressful, will will make you be able to to do the task that you want to achieve during that day. So it's it's about, you know, easy in back into your routine after having a concussion. Okay. Um, and in terms of a difference between an adult and a child, do you do you see that an adult is healing faster or are children healing faster when it comes to concussions? So um that that's an interesting question right there. Um the age before, maybe too. Uh yeah so before my I, I did a study in um can't recall the, the year in 2019, I believe it was published. And, and before that date, um, it was always said that um, kids might recover within four weeks of having a concussion and adults typically they recover within two weeks. And, um, and my study, we looked at the natural recovery processes of, of kids after having a concussion. And we started noticing that when you really look at, at the curve and their trajectory, you know, most of them are actually going to be doing better at two weeks. It's just um, a small proportion that are still going to have symptoms and the symptoms are, are, are you know, they're, they're still on their recovery pathway and, you know, they, they will recover from, from the concussion. And often these, uh, th those that take longer to recover are female adolescents. Um, okay. And yes, so and in terms of recovery uh, i don't know if you can answer that one or if you you know actually but are athletes recovering better um either some of them sometimes they take you know uh, performance enhancement drugs or steroids or stuff like that would like the hormones help them recover faster maybe testosterone or you know some are, do hormones actually affect your recovery that's a good question that I would not be able to okay. answer. I think, I, and yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure about that one, but I can tell you that just in, in adolescence, um, in those that are part of, of sports or competitive sports, they tend to recover faster than those that are not with the sports. And I mean, what one theory behind that is just that the, the brain is, um, that perhaps has, um, you know, when, when you do a lot of physical activity, you have uh, already a lot of these important proteins that, that already exist are, and are there to help your brain heal faster. Okay. Um, and so, so perhaps that would be, you know, they're, they're resilient to the concussion. Perhaps that, that's one of the reasons why they heal faster. Okay, awesome. And in all of your research, what was maybe the mind-blowing thing that you learned uh, for yourself that you were like, wow, that's totally amazing. It doesn't need to be concussion related, but just in the years that you've been doing so many studies, what is the single biggest breakthrough um, that you found out for yourself? Uh, if there's one uh, in terms of knowledge. Um, I have one, but I can't say it because it's a paper that's being uh, published soon. Um, let me think. Uh, well, I think it, it, what's very groundbreaking is um, that that for me, I, I think it is awesome, and it's not necessarily something that that I discovered, but is just that you can really leverage the power of yourself and the power of your brain. Mm -hmm. to be able to heal right it's um it, i think we don't put enough emphasizes on the fact that you know after having a concussion physical activity is actually good for you yeah and and it's actually good for the economy as well because you know these kids that might be more at risk of having persistent post-concussive symptoms if we can reduce their risk well we're actually reducing as well um the the chance of them having to go see a physiotherapist the chance of them having to go see you know other allied health um and so it, it really helps the economy so i think that that might be the a big i, I think that is a, a huge finding right it is that, a huge breakthrough for sure um, compared to yeah. what it, it was before of like limit your activity and stuff um, when you say return to activities would that be 
let's say they play contact sports or something like that would would maybe returning to activity be bicycling or something that just gets the blood moving gets them moving but is less prone to uh, contact per se exactly so when, when i say returning to physical activity it's always gradual return to physical activity so someone yeah. that would be doing contact sports they cannot go do contact sports within 48 hours okay of time they're they really need to gradually ease in um, until they are. Um, so actually to return to contact sports, there's a, this rule in Ontario that you need to be, um, you, you need to be, uh, what's the term for it? This um, cleared. Yes. So you need to be cleared by your, your doctor okay. in order to return to the contact sports. But in order for you to get to that point, well, you ease in exactly into that physical activity by, you know, light walking, perhaps the first day, swimming, second whatever. Day, yeah, exactly. Second day. Well, hey, I was able to walk and my symptoms were completely tolerable. So second day, let's try, you know, light jogging. Let's try, um, you know, cycling on uh, on a um, on a uh, home bicycle. Mm -hmm. Right. How, how would you say that? Like a stand? Uh, yeah, a standalone bicycle at home. Yeah, yeah. A, stand, a standalone bicycle at home. Mm -hmm. um, third day, my symptoms were completely tolerable. Well, hey, how about I go jogging more vigorously? Or how about I go cycling outside more vigorously, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's just always increasing your intensity until you get to that point. Well, hey, today I can start drills. So often in contact sports, there's drills. So you then you start your drills. After your drills, that's where you can start, um, you know, perhaps playing with others without contact. And and you need to be cleared in order to to be able to play a game by a okay. position. And for for kids, usually it's you need to be cleared, but as well you need to have returned full time in school before playing a game. All right. So my next question for you was, how do people um can assess that they have a concussion or maybe that their child has a concussion following an incident what are the signs so um so just before if there is suspicion of having a concussion what is important to do if you're a parent or if this is your friend for instance mm -hmm. what's well, important to stop everything that you're doing um you know you wouldn't want the child if the child is playing soccer for instance you wouldn't want them to just get back up and play soccer again right mm -hmm. um so it's important to remove the child from any activity that they were doing or remove the adult remove your friend from any um activity that they were doing and assess for red flags and so what i mean by by these red flags um red flags are are different symptoms um and these symptoms can be neck pain or tenderness, for instance, double vision, seizure or convulsion, uh, weakness or tingling or burning in the hands or feet. Um, we can have severe increasing headache, a loss of consciousness, um, deterioration of conscious state, vomiting or increasing restlessness, agitated as well and um and if the child adult or, or your friend or whoever you're looking at has just one of these symptoms, it's important to bring that person to the emergency room as soon as possible. Now, if the child or the adult does not have any of these red flags, then it's important to start assessing or, or looking for concussion signs and symptoms that could occur within the next 48 hours of, of being hit on the head. And so these symptoms, this is actually um, quite long as well, but these symptoms are, for instance, headache, dizziness, nausea, um, blurred vision. Uh, we also have um, ringing in the ears or, you know, sensitivity to noise, sensitivity to, um, uh, to light, um, confusion, sadness, neck pain. So if the child has any of these signs, then, they must go to see their physician or emergency. They, they need to go to the emergency department again. And if you don't see any of these symptoms, then you just limit physical activity for the next 48 hours. And, um, and you monitor for any signs and symptoms. If there are signs or, or symptoms, suddenly the child starts having you know, nausea, uh, headache, then it's important to bring the child to the emergency department or uh, to their primary care provider uh, that can uh, diagnose for a concussion. 
Okay. And um, and so and afterwards, you know, after you have been diagnosed with a concussion, uh, you will wait 48 hours before returning to, you know, to your normal routine before gradually returning to physical activity, to your schoolwork or, or to, to work. Okay. So those are the, the important the important information that's important to, to be said. Um, now, if the child, for your second question, if the child does not get diagnosed with a concussion, but has a concussion, so, you know, for instance, the child was not removed from the activity uh, and was not assessed for red flags when uh, it is apparent that there, that there was a concussion, um, then that, that could be really dangerous for the child or for the adult. Um, as I was saying, I think earlier, when you get a concussion, um, you often have, you, you can have confusion uh, and you're slower, you're slower, you have slow reaction time. And so okay. for instance, if uh, this child is playing soccer, football, gets hit, gets back up, but starts playing again, um, he's slower to react at, let's say, catching the ball or at moving really fast to avoid another collision. And, and the second collision could be you know, even worse or, or could be fatal. Um, we do have um, a case that, that did occur um, a few years back and uh, where in, in Ontario and, um, and uh, the, the child eventually had three concussion. And so Ro Rowan Stringer, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the name, but Rowan had uh, three concussions. Uh, okay. Three in w within a week uh, and and she passed away she she died so concussions are, are serious and we do need to um if there's suspicion of concussion you need to act and bring the child adult to the emergency room or to their primary care provider for a proper diagnosis okay all right and well if if you would have something that you would like to share with our audience I mean, thank you so much for being on the podcast. I think we went around most of the questions I had in regards to your research and concussion. And um, yeah, if you would want to leave our audience with something, what would you want to share? Um, uh, about concussion, what I would like to share is concussion is an injury to the brain and it's important to take it seriously. Many actually don't seek help after having a concussion, don't go get a diagnose. And there is still, you know, thousands of concussions that are not reported each year in, in Ontario. And, um, and I think it, it, it's important, it's important to seek help, um, to get the right medical attention um, in order to avoid having prolonged symptoms. And I think that's, that's the most important component to, to remember. A uh, second component for everybody out there after having a concussion, 48 hours after, it is okay to gradually return to your activities and to uh, physical activity, as long as it does not um, create more symptoms, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast and thanks for taking the time out of your day to join me and join us on this episode to share your knowledge with our audience. It's been uh, very much appreciated and uh, keep doing your research because as we know, science evolves all the time and things that we once thought were the way to go are no longer the way to go today. And uh, it's always interesting to see where science is going to lead us. So thank you so much for being on the podcast. It was amazing. And for people, if they have any questions, are you available by email to answer any questions? Um, I, I could be. Um, that's a, a good question. I'm not sure where I would refer them to. Um, but but just before, if you do have questions uh, about uh, recognizing a concussion, you know, just uh, protocol management, etc., we do have uh, our website that I did mention earlier about the living guidelines. But we mm -hmm. also have um, these um, this app that exists that you can install on your phone. That's called right. Concussion Ed. Um, okay. So for education, so it's concussion and then capital E D, yeah. and it's both in French and English, which is great. And all the, it's an up to date, really, really good app that helps you uh, understand how to um, to recognize a concussion in order to go get help. Um, and it has a bunch of other information about persistent post concussive symptom, et cetera. Um, so, yes. Um, yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. And that's very interesting about the app. So make sure to check it out. 
And until next time, thanks for watching or listening to another episode of the Living Better Podcast. Here we go, here we go Bye, again. everybody. Trying hard, but you want to be my friend. Ain't no place to hide, ain't no one to run to. Here we go, here we go again. Call my bluff, I'ma be a TV.